This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Israel's bombardment of Gaza has entered its fourth month, as United Nations' top humanitarian official warns the relentless assault has left Gaza uninhabitable. According to Palestinian health officials, the death toll in Gaza has topped 23,000, including almost 10,000 children. U.N. Emergency Relief Chief Martin Griffith said Gaza Gaza has become a, quote, place of death and despair. He said Gaza's on the verge of famine as it faces the, quote, highest levels of food insecurity ever recorded, unquote. Israel's war continues to take a devastating toll on Palestinian journalists. By one count, 110 journalists have been killed in Gaza over the past more than three months. On Sunday, an Israeli airstrike in southern Gaza killed two journalists, Mustafa Thuraya of AFP and Hamza al-Dadou. Hamza was the eldest son of Al Jazeera's Gaza bureau chief, Wael al-Dadou, who had already lost his wife, daughter, another son and a grandson in an Israeli airstrike in October. In December, Wael was injured himself in a drone strike that killed his cameraman, Samar al duka On Sunday, Wael al dadu decried the Israeli attacks on his family and the people of Gaza. The world must see with their own eyes and not with Israel's eyes. It must listen and watch all that is happening to the Palestinian people. What has Hamza done to them? And what has my family done to them? What have civilians in Gaza Strip done to them? They have not done anything. The world is blinded by what is going on in Gaza. Al Jazeera journalist Hind Khaldri broke down crying on air as she talked about the death of her friend and colleague, Hamza al Dadu. Hamza was a very beautiful man and journalist and friend, and I, I don't want to cry, but I'm reporting this right now because I know that if, if Hamza was here, he wanted me to report and he wanted all of our, his colleagues to report and to continue reporting. And I'm so proud of Hamza and everything he did and everything he reported during the 90 days and more than 90 days and how he was very strong. Despite everything he went through with his father, Hamza was a great friend for, for everyone. And every, our tears today is because we miss him and we're going to miss him and we're going to miss his smile. Al Jazeera's Hamza al Dadu was killed on the day U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken went to Qatar. Qatar owns Al Jazeera. Meanwhile, the United Nations reports there are just five doctors remaining at Al Aqsa Hospital, the largest hospital in central Gaza, which is coming under repeated attacks by Israel. The World Health Organization says 600 patients have been forced to evacuate the hospital, the whereabouts of those former patients now unknown. Sean Casey, the WHO medical team coordinator, spoke from inside the hospital. There are patients coming in every few minutes, um, and it's, it's really a chaotic scene. The hospital director just spoke to us, and he said his one request is that this hospital be protected, even though many of his staff have left, even though this hospital is under enormous pressure. The one request that the hospital director said is that the international community needs to make sure that this hospital and other hospitals like it stay protected, that they not get struck, that they not get evacuated, that they're able to continue functioning. That's the critical message for today. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz is reporting a group of family members of Israelis who were killed in Kibbutz Be'eri on October 7th are demanding a probe into how their relatives died. An Israeli brigadier general recently admitted he ordered an Israeli tank commander to fire on a home where Hamas fighters were holding 15 Israeli hostages. Brigadier General Barak Hiram told The New York Times he'd ordered the tank commander to, quote, break in, even at the cost of civilian civilian casualties. Only two of the 15 Israeli hostages survived. A suspected Israeli strike in southern Lebanon killed a senior commander in an elite unit of Hezbollah earlier today in a move that further escalates tension in the region. Security sources told Reuters Israel struck a car carrying Wissam al-Tawil and another Hezbollah fighter. Last week, Israel assassinated a Hamas leader outside Beirut.
U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken is back in the Middle East to meet with leaders across the region. During a stop in Qatar, Blinken warned the war in Gaza could, quote, easily metastasize into a regional war. While Blinken's publicly calling for de-escalation, the Biden administration continues to face criticism for sending more weapons to Israel while carrying out its own attacks on Iraq and Syria, as well as targeting Houthi forces in Yemen. On Friday, the prime minister of Iraq threatened to kick out U.S. troops after a U.S. drone strike in Baghdad killed a leader of an Iranian-backed militia. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is facing growing questions about why he did not inform President Biden or top Pentagon officials after he was admitted into the intensive care unit of Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. Austin was hospitalized Monday, but Biden did not find out until Thursday. Austin's top deputy also did not know, even though she had assumed some of his duties while on vacation in Puerto Rico. The Pentagon said Austin was first hospitalized on December 22nd for an elective surgery. After being discharged a day later, he was admitted again on New Year's Day after experiencing severe pain. He remains hospitalized. Hundreds of Boeing 737 MAX 9 flights have been grounded or canceled after a refrigerator-sized fuselage door plug blew off an Alaska Airlines plane near Portland, Oregon, Friday. The incident, which occurred at 16,000 feet, forced the plane to make an emergency landing in Portland. The National Transportation Safety Board has revealed Alaska Airlines had concerns about the plane prior to the incident, but kept flying it. During three recent flights, the plane's auto-pressurization fail light had illuminated. In response, Alaska Airlines had restricted the plane from flying over water to increase the chances the pilots could, quote, return very quickly to an airport. In 2019, all Boeing 737 MAX 8 jets were grounded after 346 people died in crashes in Ethiopia and Indonesia. We'll speak with the mother of one of those victims who died in the Ethiopian crash, as well as a former Boeing supervisor, later in the broadcast. In Bangladesh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has won a fourth straight term in a race marred with controversy after Bangladesh's main opposition party boycotted the elections. The opposition BNP, Bangladesh Nationalist Party, says as many as 20,000 of its members have been jailed in recent months in a nationwide crackdown. Many are speculating whether Hasina is trying to turn Bangladesh into a one-party state. She's the daughter of the founding president of Bangladesh. Wayne LaPierre, the longtime head of the National Rifle Association, has announced he's resigning ahead of opening arguments in a major corruption trial. New York Attorney General Letitia James sued LaPierre and other top NRA executives for using the group as a, quote, personal piggy bank. The trial could result in the NRA being dissolved. LaPierre has led the NRA since 1991. Meanwhile, New York Attorney General Letitia James has asked a judge to issue a $370 million fine against Donald Trump, his two adult sons, and the Trump Organization for committing decades of financial fraud. In a new court filing, James also asked for Trump to be barred from the New York real estate industry. In other legal news, the U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to hear an appeal from Trump after judges in Colorado ruled the former president's ineligible to appear on Colorado's primary ballot. The justices will decide whether Trump violated the insurrectionist clause of the U.S. Constitution for his role in the January 6th insurrection. Oral arguments will be held February 8th. Meanwhile, President Biden has denounced Trump as a threat to democracy. In his first campaign speech of 2024, Biden spoke in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, on the eve of the third anniversary of the January 6th insurrection. Donald Trump's campaign is about him, not America, not you. Donald Trump's campaign is obsessed with the past, not the future. He's willing to sacrifice our democracy, put himself in power.
Biden is heading to Charleston, South Carolina today to speak at the Mother Emanuel AME Church, where the white supremacist Dylan Roof shot dead nine black parishioners in 2015. The Supreme Court is allowing Idaho to enforce its strict abortion ban, lifting an injunction that protected emergency room physicians from prosecution if they provide the procedure to save a pregnant person's life. Friday's ruling rolled back a lower court's decision, temporarily blocking the Idaho law, which makes it a crime to perform or assist an abortion punishable with up to five years in prison. The ACLU said in response, quote, let's be very clear, the result will be that we will see more women like Kate Cox from Texas, who was forced to flee her home state to get the critical care she needed. Other women won't have that option, and some will die as a result of the abortion bans." Unquote. The government of Azerbaijan has picked a former oil executive to be the president of the next U.N. climate summit, which will be held in the oil-rich country later this year. Mukhtar Babayev spent 26 years at Azerbaijan's state oil company before becoming Azerbaijan's ecology and natural resources minister. The recent U.N. climate summit in the United Arab Emirates was also headed by an oil executive, Sultan al Jaber, CEO of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. And the acclaimed TV broadcaster Mehdi Hassan has announced he's leaving MSNBC after his show was canceled. Hassan was one of the most prominent Muslim voices on American television. In October, the news outlet Semaphore reported MSNBC had reduced the roles of Mehdi Hassan and two other Muslim broadcasters on the network, Ayman Moeldin and Ali Velshi, following the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel. Then in November, MSNBC announced it was canceling Mehdi Hassan's show shortly after he conducted conducted this interview with Mark Regev, an advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. I've seen lots of children with my own lying eyes being pulled from the rubble. Not because so, they're the pictures don't... Hamas wants you to see. Exactly my point. They're, they're, dead, they're Mark. the pictures also, Hamas wants you to see. But there are also people no, that your government that... has killed. You accept that, right? You've killed children? Or do you deny no, that? No, I do not. I do not. I do not. First of all, you don't know how those people died, those children. Oh, wow. Mehdi Hassan announced he's resigning from MSNBC last night during the final episode of his program. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org slash give.